That's right. You are listening to the Insert SEO Podcast, the podcast that paints town red with succulent search marketing insights. We are waxing poetic today as Nick Ranger is here with us on Rank Ranger. Today, we're bringing balance to the force that is SEO for e-commerce. We're getting into from technical specifications to content, what is important for e-commerce sites, how online shopping behavior has changed over time, and links for e-commerce sites, what should you be looking for, what should you be hunting for. Plus, we dive into the sites Google prefers to show in an entity's knowledge panel and what it all means. I am your host, Morty Oberstein. I am joined by the quietly roaring, semi-spiteful Sapir Carabello. Hello, Morty. <laughs> Hello, Sapir. I'm liking the semi-spiteful, quietly roaring thing. That's, that's your new uh, moniker. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that it was, fits you so perfectly. Good. It's great. So we were away. I was away. I went on vacation for a few days. You did nothing because your life is boring. Um, That's true. See, I already know. I'm not even going to ask you what you're doing with your life because I already know nothing. You're just wasting it away. Nothing. Just wasting it away. wasting it away. It's gone. Oh, God. It's a a crime. (laughs) It's a crime, Sapir. Um, It was good. Vacation was great. Oh, Um, that's good to hear. Yeah, no no one got hurt. No one. We didn't leave anybody behind. Um, (laughs) There were not many temper tantrums. So that was great. Great success all around. It was awesome. Oh, that's good. To hear. Yeah. Did you go on vacation at all? Are you going on vacation at all? No. The same? Just, nowhere to go, yeah. huh? Nothing to do. No one to see. Nowhere to go. It's that boring life of yours. It is. It's How so about you boring. take a couple of days off and watch the wall and the paint dry? Why would I do that? Because that's what you're doing already. <laughs> Do not forget, we put out a new episode of the In Search SEO podcast each and every Tuesday. You can find it on Stitcher, you can find it on Spotify, you can find it on SoundCloud, you can find it, of course, on the Rank Ranger blog, you can subscribe on iTunes, and you can find the podcast wherever great podcasts are found. Also, don't forget, we put out bonus clips from our interviews on our Twitter account. That's in search at in search underscore SEO. Check it out on Twitter. Bonus content comes out on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Also, check this out. We are partnering with the great, the legend, the brand SERP guy, Jason Barnard, to bring you deep discounted courses on building your brand on the SERP, taking control of the narrative on the SERP for your brand, how to dominate your brand SERP, which is basically your new business card. You can find the courses on rankranger.com slash reputation dash management dash courses. That's rankranger.com slash reputation dash management dash courses. We will, of course, link to that in the blog post for this podcast in the show notes. So you can just click from there. Sound good? Are you asking me? Oh, yeah, I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah, you sounded good. Thank, I'm not, no, no, I, I didn't ask, <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think, does that sound good? Great brand courses, deep discount. But thank you for commenting oh, on my voice. Yeah, that. that. Okay, yeah, it sounds good. Sounds good. Awesome. <laughs> what <laughs> way, way to pay attention there, Sapir. Oh, God. Oh, boy, we're back. Okay. Uh, great show for you today. We're following our chat from two weeks ago with Orit Mutznik on e-commerce blogging with a hard look at SEO for e-commerce with Nick Ranger. It's perfect synergy. It's amazing. If I didn't take a week of vacation off, it would have been totally perfect, but damn me for taking vacation. Okay, but before we get into all that e-commerce and SEO goodness with Nick Ranger, who's awesome, I have to talk to you about my two favorite topics, entities on the SERP and baseball because we're going down another SEO wormhole. It's baseball time and SEO time against the pier. You can't escape it. God, God help me. It's amazing. God help me. Every, That's all I have to say. <laughs> every time I do this, I think like she's going to hate this so much, and I love that. It's awesome. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> okay. No, okay. No, I need. You enjoy my suffering. Yeah. Um. I'm, I'm. Yeah. I'm. I'm not. I'm. I'm like that. <laughs> Just with you though, because we have. A, we actually have a very really tight relationship. So I don't think people see that side. Uh. You know, all the uh-huh. stuff on the podcast is just our sarcastic joking. In case you didn't right. realize that, people. 
Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I really want to explain, like, we, I talk a lot about sports and, and entities, and I want to sort of explain why I do that. It's not because I do love sports. I do love sports, and particularly baseball. Uh, but you, for real, for realsies, you have to understand, like, if you want to look at how Google deals with the entities, sports, sports players, sports teams, sports whatever, are, in my honest opinion, the best way to do this because they're not static. Like, how often does the, uh, you know, big things, big information change at Microsoft in terms of the knowledge panel? Yeah, whatever, right? But in terms of sports teams, they're dynamic, new players, new games, new seasons. Okay, they, they have all sorts of multi-layers, teams, players, positions, so they're, and, and they're filled with tons of info. So they happen to be one of the best ways to see how Google is evolving, changing, and keeping up to date with what goes into the knowledge panel. So it's not just like, I'm a fanatic, and I'm just throwing this in your face all the time, Sapir. There's a real reason to it. No, but like, why do you have to state actual facts like that? No, I can't argue with that. That's not fair. It's a, it's a, it is what it is, okay? And and <laughs> and, and right now it's baseball well, it season. It doesn't make it any less horrible. It doesn't make it any less horrible to listen to. Just FYI. That's a fair point. Yeah. That's a fair point. Although <laughs> I do have, I do have a soothing voice. You don't. All right, really. fine. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's get anyway. into this, yeah? Okay. Yeah. So today, before we get to Nick Ranger, we're focusing on the entity site. Google shows in the knowledge panel. So not the site where the summary comes from. You know, like oh yeah, if you, you, you search for Tom Hanks, you get a little bit of a bio on Tom Hanks, comes from Wikipedia. Not talking about that link. Above that, often, not every time, is a link to a site for that entity. Right. Okay? Not in all, not, but many knowledge panels. Okay? So that make right, you with me? Yeah, yeah. Okay? So, for example, um, Tom Cruise has a knowledge panel. That weird guy. Um, and it, it, he is weird. Sorry. Why? He's just a weirdo. Tom Cruise has a knowledge panel. Yeah. And in his knowledge panel, above the description about Tom Cruise, is a link to TomCruise.com. Get it? Ah, shocking. shocking. Yeah. I'm not an idiot, Morty. Get to the point. I wasn't really talking to you when I said get it. I'm talking to the audience. I'm not saying oh, they're stupid. Oh, now you're talking to the audience. Yes, that's how. The, yes, but I'm then not. You, you tell me that I don't pay attention I, and I don't answer you. Okay. I use who I'm talking to for my convenience, because <laughs> this is not an this is an audio experience, not a visual experience. I'm describing something you have to look at. Okay, uh-huh. so okay. Tom Cruise knowledge panel. You search for Tom Cruise. You get a knowledge panel. At the top of the knowledge panel is a link to TomCruise.com, and it's right. not as simple as that. Okay, it's not as simple as you know Shaq.com when you search for Shaquille O'Neal, because hey, you have social media profiles show up in the in the organic results. You have pages related to the entity from other sites that show up, and sometimes Google actually perf- uses those for the link to the site or as the site for the entity in the knowledge panel. Yes, so. It's a little more complicated. Now, Google does prefer the entity's actual website. So 100% Shaq.com for Shaquille O'Neal is chosen over any social media profile, any other um, you know profile pages on other sites, you know, on their sports sites, whatever it is. Okay? Oh, it, okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely prefers the entity's actual site. That, that makes clear sense. Right, right. Right? But sometimes there is no page to the specific entity. Like let's say Tom Cruise didn't have a website of his own or Shaquille O'Neal didn't have a website of his own. And there are plenty of celebrities, or not maybe not celebrities, but sports stars who don't. Okay. And this is where it all began. I was searching for Aaron Judge. All rise, here comes the judge. And you're yeah, you're like yeah who okay Aaron Judge is a baseball player for the Yankees he is huge like six foot seven you know how many pounds of pure muscle he's awesome okay he happens to be not like the most he doesn't have a lot of charisma so he's not like a big social media person he he's a little bit awkward on camera which is okay. exactly why he doesn't have his own website he does have a Twitter account however. And it does rank on page one, at least on desktop where I searched. But the URL that Google uses in his knowledge panel is, and I wrote it down here, it's mlb.com slash player slash Aaron dash judge and then a bunch of numbers. 
What's on that page? What's on the good questions appear? Wow, you're on the ball. You're on the ball. Okay, so I, I, it's not like I actually care, but okay. Oh, for the audience's <laughs> sake, you are well. Yeah, you are audience. a regular mother Teresa. Um, <laughs> MLB is stands for Major League Baseball. That is the baseball league in America, and that's the league where Aaron Judge plays. That's who he plays for. Okay. 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 So on the page is a profile of that player, a little bit about him, his stats, you know, that 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 sort of thing. What you would basically you know, expect to see for a sports player, bit of a bio, bit of stats. Okay, but again, so it does make sense. It, no, it makes sense, but oh, 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 it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay, and yeah, that's a, uh, you're 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 totally on target with me here. I'm glad we're on the same page. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because what Google did here was Google chose a page that didn't that does not belong to the entity over a page that does belong to an entity to the entity in this case, the Twitter page. Okay. Aaron Judge, this sports player we're talking about, has a Twitter account. The Twitter account ranks on page one. Google knows it's there. It's in the knowledge panel. And instead of using the social media profile, which, by the way, Google often does. Right? For Tom Brady, you get a social media profile. I think it's Instagram profile or Facebook profile, something like that. But it shows a page from Major League Baseball's website, his player page on Major League Baseball's website over... A page that belongs to the entity, Aaron Judge. He controls that Twitter account. He controls that page. It's his. It belongs to him. It belongs to the entity, which is why it's surprising. It's also wow. surprising, right? And, and, and by the way, and what's also interesting here is that there are many, many websites that rank on page one that show the same exact, not the same exact, but the same type of information that Major League Baseball shows on their page. All sorts of pages rank on page one when you type in the name of a sports player that show a bio, that shows some stats about them, lots of pages that do this. But it shows Major League Baseball's page, which, by the way, ranked towards the bottom of the SERP, not towards the top of the SERP. There were pages that did the same thing, show player stats, show a player bio, that rank above Major League Baseball's site that shows the same thing for the same player. But Google chose the Major League Baseball MLB.com page. Why? Because Google, and this is where it's awesome. Because Google understands that Major League Baseball and the entity in question, Aaron Judge, are intrinsically connected. They're one and the same, so to speak. It's like um, you know, genus and species. Okay, The genus is the league. The species is the player itself. So Google understands that part of the entity, part of the entity's identity is Major League Baseball. So we're going to put a site into this player's knowledge panel that reflects, who he, that reflects the entity itself, Major League Baseball. In other words, it's not putting a foreign site into the entity's knowledge panel. It's saying, hey, we're going to th- Google saying we're going to throw Major League Baseball's website into the particular player's knowledge panel because the entity and Major League Baseball, in this case, the league and the player, are really one thing. So that's really cool. Right. And it's but a big deal why- that they didn't use a Twitter page. But why? <laughs> why is it a big deal that Google didn't use it? Because if I remember correctly, there's also in the knowledge panel, there's also like a section of uh, social media. Right. So Yeah, and that's there for this player. His Twitter, his Twitter page is also linked over there, right? It's linked there, but it's not linked as the as reflected as the entity's website. It's like you know, the site that belongs to the entity where you want to go to learn more about him or her. In this case, him. But if, if, it, if it still links link, link over there, why is it a big deal then? No, no, it's, it's a big deal because it's saying that this that the Twitter account does not reflect the entity as much as a page that does not on a website that does not actually belong to the entity. That's why it's a big deal. Okay, oh. the Twitter page, like I said, belongs to the entity. TomCruise.com belongs to Tom Cruise. This player's oh. Twitter account belongs to them. The leak site does not belong to them. He's not in control. Aaron Judge, the player here, is not in control of any of the content that goes up on this page. I would assume Tom Cruise, if he knows how to read and write, which I am not sure is the case, controls the content that goes up on TomCruise.com, in theory. Okay, Aaron Judge, the baseball player, has no input on what goes up on this site. Now, other players who have the same player page, player page, that's a tongue twister, player page, player page, on Major League Baseball's website, have their Twitter account used. Like Mike Trout, another famous player. He has the same you know, bio on the Major League Baseball website, but he 
Guess that Twitter, his Twitter account, the link to his Twitter page is what Google uses as the entity's site in the knowledge panel, not in the Major League Baseball profile page. So did it happen to just like one player or is there, are there any other cases that... Than just these two, like okay, oh, okay, yeah, um, yeah. I looked at a whole bunch. Like for example, there's another player, Justin Verlander, like Aaron Judge. He also has a Twitter account that ranks on page one, but Google uses his Major League Baseball profile page because again, Google's saying Major League Baseball and this player are really one and the same from a certain perspective. So this does reflect the entity. But you know, the common denominator was, by the way, when the Google does go with the social profile versus going with the league's page, the league's profile page. No is that the player has to be active. And like Mike Trout, who does get Twitter in his knowledge panel as the link, as like the site link, like this is the entity's page, is very active, at least when I ran the query, is very active on Twitter. Okay, Aaron Judge, Justin Verland, or not. Uh, that's actually interesting. So you're, you're saying that Google is taking into consideration the actual account activity. Yeah, because I, I think what's going on here is like there's like a bidding, okay? Google... Google wants um, the page to own the, the page to be owned by the entity themselves. Okay, hence Shaq.com for Shaquille O'Neal. It right. doesn't right. It doesn't want to put a Twitter profile in there. It doesn't want to put a Major League Baseball page profile. It wants really it wants what it wants is the the actual entity's website. Okay, now mm -hmm. if that doesn't exist, it will take the next best thing. Oh, another page, a social profile page owned by the entity. That's like the next thing in line. Okay, first best. The page, the page, the site that belongs to the actual entity. Second best, a, a social profile that belongs to the entity. However, there's a conflict in the bidding here. If that, if that page is not active, Google will take another page that's connected to the entity, that's part of the entity's identity. In this case, a league page, and show that instead, because this is what I think. This is what I'm speculating a little bit because it, the whole idea of putting the website there for the entity so you can learn more about the entity. Right? Yeah. Why is TomCruise.com there for Tom Cruise? So you can learn, you know, learn more about Tom Cruise and all of his shenanigans. But if the player if, or if the entity is not active on social media, what are you going to learn about them? That they don't tweet? Right. right. right? So it'll, it'll forego its desire to have a controlled page, a page controlled by the entity for a page that is part of the entity but may not be controlled by them. Kind of cool. But then, what, can I ask a question? No. Then what about uh, a knowledge panel that don't link to any website. Yeah, I, that's a good question. I don't know why that is. Like, there's, there's a lot of, and you particularly celebrities, a lot of them don't. They, they they might have websites, and they might they definitely have social media profiles, and they don't get a link in there. That's a great question. I don't have the answer to that. By the way, can I tell you something interesting? Like really, really, really yeah. quickly. Side point. So you know, Google shows like a, a Twitter box, a Twitter carousel. If the if the account is active, right? So yeah. if you Google like I don't know, I don't know who's famous, Tom Hanks, and he's and he's got an active Twitter account. <laughs> you get a box, and you can scroll through all his tweets. Not all of them, but a lot right, of them, right? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. For some major entities, you know, like famous people, Google will sometimes show a single Twitter card on mobile. So not a carousel, but one card that shows one single tweet. And even if that tweet was posted like days ago, like a while ago, like a week ago, two weeks ago even. Oh, kind of weird. Yeah, it's cool, right? Yeah, it is weird. It's weird. I guess. It's weird also that the dates, like, you know, it's not like, he, you know, they tweeted the day before. It's like they tweeted a week ago. By the way, like, super, okay, really, really quickly, it doesn't do that with everyone. For everyone I've seen, you have to be really, really well-known or super famous or super well-known. Like, in the sports world, only the top, 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 top players will get a single card of a tweet showing up in the results if they tweeted, like, you know, even two weeks ago. But what was really weird Okay, this is okay. A little bit of a, like a wormhole in a wormhole. Okay, so yeah. I looked for a bunch of baseball players. It only showed up for the best of the best baseball players, like the superstars. Like the, even that, even a okay. big star, if they tweeted two weeks ago, they don't get that card. That that that, that little like you know single card. But if it's a superstar and they tweeted two weeks ago, they will get that single card often. Okay. So I said, okay, okay. let's check out other sports. See what's going on. Now in America, yeah. baseball is uh, not as popular as football. Football is like amazingly popular. And okay. there are players in football who are talked about all year long. And one particular player who I did this on purpose, Aaron Rodgers, he's, been ta he's in the news every single day. There are way more people searching for him in the offseason on a given day than your biggest baseball star during the baseball season. So I'm like, all right, let's oh, check wow. out. Yeah. 
So let's check out Aaron Rodgers and his Twitter account. He tweeted when I, when I searched, you know, 10 days earlier, just like some of the mm-hmm. baseball players I saw. When you go to his SERP, he does not get a Twitter card. Oh, seriously? Yeah, very weird. He's like way more popular. I looked up for, you know, this guy, John Carlos Stanton, a baseball player, not nearly as popular as Aaron Rodgers. Stanton, he, the baseball player, he got the Twitter card. He tweeted 10 days earlier. Aaron Rodgers, the way more popular football player, he tweeted 10 days earlier also. He did not get a Twitter card. So I'm wondering, maybe it's like a, 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 an equation of popularity versus seasonality or relevance. Like, top baseball players got to be top celebrities, top sports stars, but it has to be relevant. Like, oh, it's baseball season. You're relevant. So I wonder if during football season, the baseball player will lose a Twitter card and the football player will get it. We'll have to wait and see. Right. Because okay. yeah, it was awesome. That's, that's that was awesome. That was an awesome wormhole. <laughs> went, went, went on way too long. Really sorry. But it's really cool stuff. If you're an entity if you're, or if you're a brand or whatever and all this good stuff, it's something to really think about what sites show up in your page, how you can manipulate this, right? You're using your social profile to get whatever site you want to show up. Like maybe you don't have a good website, which would be weird if you're a brand. Mm-hmm. But hey, your social media profile can show up in there. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of implications. It's really cool stuff. By the way, it speaks exactly to what we were plugging earlier, Jason Barnard's courses. There it goes. That was not on purpose, by the way. That was not on purpose. <laughs> okay, I can keep going down this wormhole forever, but yeah, we won't. I know. We won't. <laughs> That's it. We're done. Okay. God, okay. So from my awesome exploration rant wormhole on the sites that Google uses in the knowledge panel and how Google will give preference with a Twitter card to certain entities at certain times on the mobile SERP to my awesome chat with an awesome SEO. She is an amazing rising superstar. Here's all about SEO for e-commerce with Nick Ranger. Here comes another search marketing expert. It's time for an in-search interview. You're listening to another In Search SEO podcast interview. Today we have a rising star, a a shooting star. She is one of the fastest rising SEO influencers on the planet. She comes from a land down under and as a woman hard at work as the senior SEO specialist at Australia Studio Hawk. Please welcome Nick Ranger here on Rank Ranger. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I am um, absolutely thrilled to be here. I'm a huge fan of Rank Ranger and I feel like uh, my last name is Ranger and <laughs> that's real. I promise. That's real. I didn't just like, you know, change it just so I could get on here. So you should be like oh, our brand so spokesperson. <laughs> Nick Ranger for Rank Ranger. It's so easy. It works. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, hey, if it's, if it's, if it's on offer. Um, I'm not gonna say no. <laughs> oh, I, I don't. I don't say no to bringing influencers on to have them peddle the product. That's, I never say no to that. You always say yes <laughs> whenever somebody offers that. So we have something in common. We were both teachers. Um, I taught awesome. in Baltimore City for it felt like ten years. It was only two and a half years. And you were a music teacher in Cambodia. Yes, I was for about a year of my life. Wow. Um, so you know, full uh, full disclosure. Um, I'm a professional violinist. Um, I've been playing no. violin for about twenty three, twenty four years. Oh go away, I'm starting to really, That's amazing. really um get get in there in the years. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I I started off as a classical musician. Um, I pretty much finished my teaching degree in um, in violin musicianship, and then after that, I decided. Um, like orchestras are great, um, love them, but I kind of wanted more. So I went down the route of electric violin, um, oh. did a whole bunch with bands and things like that. And then just kind of found myself um, in, like in Cambodia, um, needing, needing something to do. So uh, I just decided to volunteer my time and become a music teacher for a year. First off, that's amazing. Secondly, how do you just end up in <laughs> Cambodia? I was, yeah, I was walking around, I left the house this morning and I end up in Cambodia. <laughs> oh, look, I'm the kind of person that likes to say yes and then figure out the details <laughs> later. So, you know what? Um, <laughs> hey, do you want to get, oh, get, get some pizza and go to Cambodia? Yeah, sure. Oh my gosh, you know, that and a couple of tequila shots. Who knows what can happen? <laughs> <laughs> is that what happened? There's a couple of tequila shots? Are we like, where am I? Wait, is this Cambodia? Oh boy, I don't know. I'll have to I'll have to go back and really um, scratch my head. But um, it was such a fantastic experience. So I wouldn't trade it in for the world. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So who's your favorite violinist? 
Ooh, uh, Ray Chen, um, like classically, he's absolutely incredible. Um, I've seen him quite a few times and oh, if you can get an opportunity to see him, um, I highly recommend that. Nigel Kennedy is also fantastic. And um, he's also exceptionally cheeky. Uh, he took a, a, a Stradivarius uh, cello, which is like one of the rarest cellos on the planet. Literally, they're millions of dollars worth. Um, and he swapped it out for um, this cheapo cello and he decided like um, as everyone was sitting down he just went over and smashed it in front of nice. the whole orchestra nice. the whole audience so he's like Pete Townsend everyone oh absolutely nice. just like pure punk I did not I did <laughs> not know that too. I did not yeah, know there was a um, Pete Townsend of of a violinist that's awesome oh man it gets pretty hardcore <laughs> see I don't know anything about this I don't know who any of these people are all I know who it's like Perlman is from Sesame Street and that's about it <laughs> That's pathetic. Oh, boy. It's, yeah, yeah there's, there's definitely some really amazing characters out there. But, um, yeah, those two really um, shaped my my love of, of violin when I was young. So definitely check that out if you're into the violin or you want to be into the violin. But we are talking about e-commerce and SEO. So it's funny. Like, I, don't know, I, I have a very, very bad like timeline of events. So I believe it was five, six months ago, Search Engine Lane came out with a whole periodic table around e-commerce. And it sort of feels like e-commerce mm-hmm. is like taking on a whole new life. And I'm like sort of wondering, why? Like why all of a sudden now is e-commerce sort of come into its own when it's been around forever? Not forever. But... Yeah, I think um, I think like a lot of people, and especially now, um, you know, during COVID and things like that, like uh, everyone's taking a real hard look as um, you know, like how people search and how people buy. Um, you know, of course, right now it's in repression because um, a lot of these sales are going online. So a lot of people are having a lot more of a, a think into like, you know, what's my long term strategy for my, my business? Like, um, you know, am I going to be solely relying on stores um, like you know, brick and mortar for the rest of um, my, my career? I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. So more and more people are looking at what they can do with selling products online. Um, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's happening um, that's really, really exciting in SEO um, and definitely on the horizon. Um, so, you know, with unpaid shopping, tab listings, like um, core web vitals being rolled out and insane complexity with some featured snippets that's being rolled out as well. I think, um, you know, just in terms of like being able to take up so much more real estate in a SERP. Um, is is becoming a lot more uh, a lot more competitive. So um, e-commerce is just one of those beasts that I think um, as search matures, as as people's understanding of um, you know trying to find products and trying to find information, um, yeah, there's just it's just getting even more and more interesting. <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering how do feature snippets play into an e-commerce strategy because they are essentially or they were designed to be an informational tool. Yeah, well. You know, as as um as the, like updates happen, like uh, it used to be like position zero, then Google kind of came out and said like, hey, if you get um, a featured snip or position zero, um, then you won't get an organic listing for right. the first hundred. Um, well, that is the organic uh, listing. Keyword. Yeah, exactly. And and then you're exactly right. Then it became an organic listing, and so a lot of people are now trying to think like okay, well, um, structured data is going to play a lot more um, of a role with um, with the way that I map out um, my content and my frameworks and things like that. Um, so I think uh, I think featured snippets really do play a really interesting part in um, you know how people will find things. It's um, it's there for branding. Um, I don't necessarily think that it's always the best solution um, because and I say this purely because like it's not always the thing that gives you the the best click through rate. Right. Um, so it like, you know, with anything in SEO, it really does depend on what kind of um, what kind of result is um, been appearing in there for a featured snippet, have a look at whether that's actually been um, meaningful for you, um, whether there's competitors that are kind of fighting for that space and like really consider like, you know, at the end of the day, what's the end goal? What's the ROI for that? Um, it might be that, um, you know, you can roll out and, you know, if, if you're lucky to get a featured snippet, that's awesome. Um, evaluate whether that works for you. Um, but otherwise, if that's not something that um, does work for you and, and I guess organic listening will be better, then there's always like the no snippet tags um, or the max snippet tags that limits the character limits. So there's a lot of things that you can do um, with 
one getting them two managing them and three maybe um you know deciding that that might not be the best solution for you is that something you use the the no the um that you limit the the character to the snippet or you go no snippet yeah we've done that um we, yeah so like i've used more of the max snippet because i i don't really like limiting um you know opportunities for rich snippets so if we're going to get a rich snippet for yeah a, a page I'd rather that we use like a max snippet so that, um, you know, maybe I might just limit the max snippet to like say 50 characters, um, which wouldn't qualify for a featured snippet, right. um, but it might be able to appear somewhere else. So um, it's just it's just really about, um, you know, being quite stubborn on the vision, but, um, you know, flexible on the details. So how, I wonder how, how much time is your of your day spent in dealing with structured data? Um, well, it depends on. <laughs> it depends. SEO. It depends. Everything is. De it depends. But um, like, largely speaking, um, it's kind of like what I will plan um, a little bit further down the track. The first things that I want to make sure that with any new campaign is that uh, we do a full technical audit. So I want to see everything that is, um, you know, under the hood, um, you know, that's broken, that could be optimized, or um, is kind of blocking results. And um, you know, basically map out planning for how we can facilitate and, and get that better. Um, then I want to have a look at the content. I want to have a look at whether they've been able to match the um, the user intent to their pages, and, or um, you know, in the case of if it's a if it's a kind of um, site that's YMYL, uh, your money or your life, um, which has you know EAT expertise, authority, and trust, whether or not that's going to play into how the content. Um, will be perceived by web crawlers. So, so yeah, yeah <laughs> that's okay. kind of that's kind of where I would look at it. And then once that's done, that's where we look at like furthering opportunities to take up real estate in the SERP. So uh, I hope that kind of in a roundabout way answered your question. Don't totally answer my question. Um, I'm wondering how many uh, percentage wise, right? Because I've always found this really interesting. Um, the Shopify mm -hmm. has a sort of okay reputation within the SEO industry when really there are a lot of problems with Shopify. I'm um, so so two yeah. questions. One is why is that? Like why isn't Shopify we like to <laughs> clobber everything. Like we clobber everything in the SEO industry. If you like you say the word mm. SEO the wrong way, there's like 40 million trolls on Twitter coming after you. But for some reason yeah, Shopify it's... escapes this wrath and I'm confused. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's so funny that you mentioned, um, you know, Shopify, SEO and Twitter, um, you know, if you're um, like, I, I love Twitter. <laughs> it's I, a funny little beast. Um, Twitter's I will, the best. I will like, you know, insert my, yeah. Twitter's the <laughs> it's, best. It's, yeah, it's really, really fun. Sometimes like you can have the popcorn and sit back and just kind of like let the, <laughs> let the riots ensue. There's um, some or, crazy stuff on Twitter. Absolutely. Or you can roll up your sleeves and get into it. I mean, right now, the um, the CEO of uh, Shopify, and this kind of like blew up a little bit as far as an SEO, uh, like things going viral, I guess this board have probably considered going viral, uh, where the, the Shopify SEO was basically saying like nine out of 10, uh, I, I need to remember the tweet, nine out of 10 SEOs aren't, are essentially like, you know, selling snake oil, like Shopify SEO is oh, really? um, pretty Wait. much perfect. The CEO of Shopify said that? And, yeah, and I so missed it? Course... How did I miss that? <laughs> yeah. Um, Wait, yeah, can I still tweet about this? Is it still a thing? Because I want to go on Twitter now and like be like righteously outraged. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, I, I, also, like, by the way, do you want to buy sure. some snake oil? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot selling. <laughs> a lot selling. I have a whole stock of it. I sell it every time I do SEO. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, the price variance is, um, you know, pretty pretty outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know what? Like with Shopify, so I've got heaps of clients that are that use Shopify, um, and you know, with with really great um, really great results. I've got a couple of uh, my enterprise level clients. That are running Shopify. That's um, I would I would pretty much consider like market leaders. So mm -hmm. look, there's a lot of things that um, out of the box that Shopify does really well, and a lot of things that I think that you kind of need to um, like you kind of like need to like tool it and really make it your own. So, for example, um, you know there's things that you have control of and the things that you don't have control over. So like the obvious ones are like robots.txt, um, sitemaps. Um, like in your sitemap, um, like image and video sitemaps are, aren't really considered. So um, I know a lot of SEOs will like, um, I've, I haven't actually done this with the robots TXC, but I heard somewhere, um, I think through Ross Tavendale, who was saying that someone like can 
through one of robust.txt and host it externally um, and be able to like utilize that. Um, I haven't tested that, so I don't know whether it works, but what I, um, what I have tested and what I know that works is um, hosting your sitemap on a subdomain mm. um, and being able, being able to like, you know, get it happening that way. So there are things that you can do for that, um, which are really, really awesome. Uh, I think the second thing um, is that, you know, you don't have control over the service because essentially it's, you know, Shopify hosted. Yeah. So it's not really uh, an ability to be able to do any log file analysis, which can really, um, you know, shine the light on some really, um, you know, complex issues that are kind of dragging the site down. Um, so, you know, that's not great. Um, and of course, like, you know, you mentioned with canonicalization, um, Shopify makes all of their sites um, essentially have like a flat informational structure. Um, which essentially what that means is like, you know, everything is forced into collections. So, um, you know, everything is canonicalized at the product level. So whereby like with normal, normal sites, you might have like the category and, and the type um, or category, sub subcategory, and then the product. Whereas like um, on Shopify, you've got the category and um, maybe like the subcategory, but then that will go to um, the product um on a on a separate url so um yeah it like that is essentially yeah. like um decentralizing it and making it uh, quite a flat structure <laughs> um and of course when you want to like use um structured data to be able to give like a bit more um context to that um you know you'll have your breadcrumbs that you can't really like once you get to the product you can't go back to um you, you can't actually go back to the the product um you know, the category page or like the subcategory page, you kind of need to go back to the home and then find it again, which, you know, if you use breadcrumbs, which I know I certainly do, I know a lot of my friends who are SEOs, I definitely do. Um, just be like, yeah, I just click the little button at the top and it just like, I'll use that to toggle back and forth. Um, so yeah, it makes it a little bit difficult. But it's funny because like yeah. it, it's, it's <laughs> there are a bunch of it just goes to show you by the way because there are a lot of technical issues with with Shopify. But you're saying that it works for your enterprise clients. Is that there's never like a linear equation like okay this is bad this is bad therefore this whole this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. It all it it all depends on the situation like hey for this client right they're doing X mm -hmm. Y and Z and Shopify can be utilized for them and then the positives of Shopify outweigh the negatives of it. Yeah, I feel like it's just like having a really good understanding of um you know the the positives and negatives of any cms i mean no cms is um is perfect i know a lot of people will argue against that <laughs> um but you know it's it's just about like knowing what you can do uh, on a particular particular site um and then just trying to do that to the best of your ability to be able to like um leverage the result that you're after so um yeah i just i just think it's just um, again, to use, uh, I think this is a Jeff Bezos quote, <laughs> um, stubborn on vision, but flexible on the details, I think definitely applies here. Well, that's nice. I like that. Um, so let's talk about blogging for a second. I was talking to um, Arit Mutznik about blogging for e-commerce sites. And one of the things that I, I, I don't read, I will be honest with you, I don't read blogs and e-commerce sites. <laughs> this is not my, when I want to figure out, hey, how should I spend my time effectively? It's not reading blogs and e-commerce yeah. sites. However, I did dive into a bunch of different ones when I was talking to her. I'm like, all right, let me take a look. Mm. And they all suck. They're just like, <laughs> they're all like terrible. And I, I, I see a lot of blogs you can't, just pushing their products. Like here's a blog post about mm. scarves. And these are, of course, the best scarves. And of course, we sell, we just happen to sell these best scarves. And I don't find that it works, at, le at least yeah. for me. But since you actually do e-commerce, does pushing your product through a blog post on an e-commerce site work? I really um, think it's really important to consider who the target audience is. So um, for you personally, uh, you would be a B2C type customer. So for you, like maybe, um, you know, seeing the best of kind of like wrap up lists might not be applicable when it comes to like scarves. But if you're a B2B um, kind of, you know, you're a business owner and you're wanting to buy in bulk, scarves for your business or something like that um then having like um research around like what are the best scarves that you know, consumers are wanting to buy is actually a really really important type of blog post to have um because then that means that um they can they can be able to see the research that's going behind um the types of scarves the material 
um, the make, um, where it was made, if there, like, there's like ethical choice with um, consumers and things like that, wanting to buy like uh, more environmentally scarves. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to use your No, that, that's fine. I know, like, there's environmentally yeah, sound but, scarves. That's, that if no yeah. one's selling them, we should sell them. Yeah, but for like the B2B type of audience, um, that would be something that's really, really beneficial to them because, you know, typically they're in their beds at night, like, um, you know, <laughs> being told off by their partners, like, yeah, just go to bed, like, you know, um, we can worry about this stuff tomorrow. But like for business owners, they get really, um, you know, they, they love their business and want to make sure that they're giving, um, you know, the best products that they can to their audience. Uh, audience <laughs> to their customers so of course like they're going to want to be able to like have uh, a good stock that they know is going to be able to sell so again like it's just really considering like you know who the target audience is at the end of the day being really um you know considerate about um you know, whether you're whether or not like most of that is like a b2c kind of audience and writing content that you know um, they'll want to do so maybe for a B2C kind of audience, um, you know, you'll want to have like, uh, if you're looking at washing machines, like comparison between like, hey, do I want a top loader or a front loader? Like, what's the difference? What does that actually mean? I personally have absolutely no idea. <laughs> um, for me, it's a, it's a price kind of thing. Um, like as long as it washes the clothes, I'm happy. But, um, you know, for someone who has, um, you know, wants to get more qualified information about that, we'll be able to like answer the niggling question of like, what is the difference? Again, those blog posts are really, really awesome and really essential to be able to give people really um, better choices around their purchases. So um, having those kinds of blog pages, having internal links that points to the product page, that points to the category page, that even like points to like, um, you know, similar um, relevant blog posts are really, really amazing to be able to get um, get people clicking through your site and actually uh, converting to customers, which is really what, at the end of the day, a, a really well-designed blog um, is there to do. That's funny because it makes a lot of sense when you say that because it's very, it's very informational content, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to show yeah. you um, how to choose a washing machine. Right? Which one do I buy? I'm front loader. Yeah. I, I'm all for front loader washing machine. Only because I have a <laughs> counter where it goes, so I can't have a top loading washing machine. So exactly, yeah. it has to be that way. I'm currently looking at my washing machine as I'm doing this. It's like right <laughs> on the other side of the door there. Um, <laughs> but it's funny because we don't, or even B, even even B to C. Like okay, so if you want to, I don't know, um, uh, scarves, right? Which scarf is the best for which temperature? I don't know. Totally making that yeah. up. Fine, but I, what I find is like these these blogs just end up sort of like just not thinking about okay, what content do mm -hmm. users need to walk away with to get information, or it's more just, it's more like how do I sell my product through the blog? But you're really not trying to sell the product through the blog. You're really trying to offer information, which backhandedly helps you sell the product through the blog. Absolutely. Um, I, so what I do with a lot of my clients is um, we do what's called like content pruning. So um, this is where I'll do a crawl of the entire um, blog section. Um, and uh, like I'll with this is with Screaming Frog, and I'll link it up with Google Analytics. I'll link it up with Search Console, and it's a really, really good way to be able to see like for the last twelve months or um, however long of a period of time we want to analyze, um, you know, what's actually the performance of each one of those those pages. And we can sort of like you know pick out like oh these ones are, are really really successful. Let's have a look at that and see um, potentially why. Like oh this is great. Like it actually. Um, does a really good job of um, giving users the correct information, like, you know, like um, how to install a pendant light in your kitchen countertop or something like that. Um, and that's that's doing really well because um, I can see that they've got great internal links to like lots of different pendant lights that they actually sell. Really, really great successful blog post. Yeah. Um, whereas like I might see like another one that's like, oh, what was trending in the fall of um, 2014? Exactly. And it's just like, it's just like a couple exactly. of lines. Um, and again, like, you know, for designers and things like that, um, again, thinking of the B2C or the B2B kind of audience, um, you know, those kinds of trending things uh, would be really useful for like, um, like an interior designer who's wanting to, um, you know, have a look at more ideas as to like kind of 80, 20, like some advice for a client. Right. Um, so they might look at that. No, yeah, they, that they does make sense. 
Not for me. Yes. Not for the consumer. Yeah. Directly, I, think. I don't really care what the trend was. What are the, the best scars of September? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's really just um, educating and like making sure that like every single page that you have on your website um, is the one that you want to have represent pretty much your business. Because otherwise, if you don't want users to see that, what's the point? <laughs> it's like funny because I, I think about 99.99999, I can go on percent of this, is about mindset. And I think it has to yeah. do with people. I think these bad blog creators are not bad people. I mean, maybe they're bad people. But I think it's more that they're really just anxious. Hey, I really want to sell my product. And they're so hung up on yeah. selling the product and that anxiety that goes around selling the product. They can't yeah. take a step back and say, okay, how can I actually offer information that helps? And it's I, it's about controlling your emotions i sound like yeah, mr spock 100%. now um, <laughs> damn it jim i'm a doctor uh, not a blogger um what, up, what <laughs> we can keep doing more star trek <laughs> one of the I'm, I'm, I'm down are you really you're start you're a trekkie sweet um yeah, Voyager. Oh, no. So just yeah just to be okay just to like you know expose myself there nice <laughs> I only I'm only trekking because my grandparents were really into it. We get this is like a total different wormhole. We should not go down right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of bad trek. There's a lot of good trek, and there's a lot of conversation mm-hmm. to have about trek. And I sound like a giant nerd at this moment, which is no, fine. I love it. That's okay. I could be a nerd. It's cool. I have kids. I'm married. Yeah. I'm old. I'm balding. I'm a nerd. It's fine. Anyway, <laughs> one of the things that I work, I have a lot of connections with the um, technical writing industry. And I speak to a couple of people here and there about this. And one of the things that I find is that the way people expect content to sound and the way they expect what they expect out of their content mm. is f- rapidly changing. It's very, very different. And I'm wondering if on the e-commerce side, whether it be product descriptions, whether it be blog posts, which I think may be what's happening now, do you mm. see that the way consumers are, are looking or searching what, and what they're looking for in terms of tone? how they want to buy, what they want to buy, what they want to see, what they want to read is changing. I know it's sort of like it's yeah. always changing, but I mean, like, is it really changing now? So I think, um, I think it, it is absolutely changing. And, you know, a lot of the natural language processing that um, is going through and understanding like the content on a page is maturing. Um, it's not anywhere near where I'd say like, you know, it's, oh, it's absolutely mature. You know, this is something that has been a um, machine learned over time. Um, so I can only really think, you know, um, years down the track, um, the way that, the way that like it, it um, like results populate will be a lot more qualified. So with um, with Google's um, BERT, um, bi-directional encoder. Um, yeah, um, no one I don't know. Yeah, R- R- transformation. Yeah, I, I yes. Screw that um, up. I forgot the I forgot the R acronym. Oh, I'm Always like annoyed at myself right up. now. <laughs> I don't even try anymore. Um, yeah, but like the the um the bidirectional in um, the B acronym in BERT um, really looks at um, you know understanding from things from like from left to right and from right yeah, to yeah. left. So it's it's trying to understand um, intent um, in a much more qualified way. So things around like um, like related search, um, you know, like when you're looking at like your seed keyword and maybe you've got like a page that. Um, that you've got something there and like uh, the quality of that product. So let's use mascara as an, as a, as an example, because that's a, that's a really good one. that um, one of my clients um, had a bit of an issue with um, a lot of users are looking at the kinds of quality of um, the mascara around so like um, keywords around clumping. Um, does it um, like, I don't know, is, is the, is the color sort of, um, does it will it leak after a time? Um, so longevity is another really important keyword. Um, so they're, they're around more um, the, the quality of the product kinds of, of things mm-hmm. that, um, that I think like just trying to find those, those keywords in the page to see whether they've actually like added that um, context for the user. Yep. So um, with that particular page, it was pulling out a weird bit of HTML um, from actually a review that someone had wrote on the on um, on the product page, um, saying like, "Oh, this this That's, product wasn't great that because sucks. it's clumpy." That sucks. And that was yeah, and that was pulling into the meta description of that product, and everyone was like, "What is going on? That sucks. That's insane." Um, so so for us, it was like, okay, um, 
like, let's do a little bit more research around this. And we found like, you know, oh, these are all the semantic search around um, this particular type of, of uh, well, just mascara in general. So let's make sure that like when we're optimizing content for mascaras and things like that, that we've got all of that, um, that kind of sent, um, uh, those extra searches, um, you know, considered for the page and give users that extra context mm -hmm. um, to help make them make better qualified choices. And when we did that magically, um, our, the meta description that we wanted to have um, basically yeah, changed um, because we added just like a couple of those things. Um, and that was a really, really interesting one to watch. And <laughs> um, one that like kind of like directly, um, directly attributed to uh, like a related search, which I've never really seen um, happen too often. So that was a really interesting one. <laughs> I, I see a lot of interesting things being pulled into the into the into this onto the SERP, into feature snippets, into snippets in general because of BERT. Things need to be way less structured. They're way better understanding things um, contextually without that structure sort of being there. Which Google said, hey, we don't need we don't need the structure. We can do it through machine learning. I, they've always preferred to obviously because it's more cost effective. Mm -hmm. But I do see BERT being able to say, hey, you, you know what? I understand this without the structure of the page, without the H two, without the H three, without whatever it is being there. So that is really interesting. Um, yeah. I, I'm wondering, what you, we talked about quality. I very much think, and you can maybe qualify my analysis of, my analysis of quality, that for some reason, I, I, don't, I, I can speculate why this is, users or people, people, forget users, people are starting to think of online shopping as being a much more, you know, back in the day, remember, I, I remember back in the day, you wanted to search for something, you typed in, you know, cheap shoes. And that's what you did on the internet. That's how you found mm. what you wanted. You're looking for a bargain. I, I don't really want to use the internet to buy something. I also don't want to buy, you know, the Air Jordan 25s, whatever number we're up to, for $300. Let me find to buy <laughs> cheap Jordans online. And I think that's sort of stopped. We're like, okay, this is my first place I'm going to go shop. And I want to know about the product. I want to know about, a, I want to know about the quality of the product. And of course, affordability mm. is part of that. But it seems to be a much more fuller analysis that the 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 the, the person as like i say users the people are looking for yeah and i i think that that's just because search um is is constantly maturing um and i think site um site owners and seos and in-house teams really need to um you know mature along with that so you know things that um maybe have in the past seemed a little bit trivial um to add to a page like things around warranty or shipping or things like yeah. that or after pay um if your industry um is widely doing those kinds of um things for for their customers customers expect that now so if if, if they're making choices and you know you'll see um you know you'll see your friends or you maybe even catch yourself doing it where you'll have like um different products open in like um from different companies and tabs um and you, you'll be able to you you're just basically trying to see like all right well, where where what do i like aesthetically the most that is going to fit into my home is going to like work with my current aesthetic in the home um next is it something that is like um, a reasonable price for what i'm what i'm expecting to get for that product um what's the shipping information um like like am i going to be waiting two months for the delivery that might actually influence the way that i make my decisions um is there a warranty for this product like i might make a concession if i get a 10-year warranty on this because i feel like yeah i might pay a little bit more for that peace of mind um so i feel like again you kind of need to be a little bit more aware of what your competitors are doing just in terms of um being able to benchmark what your customers are expecting yeah i think those um, expectations are very very rapidly yeah. changing across the board for whatever vertical of content that it is for some reason again we can go into a whole other conversation across the board i think content on the web the expectations of it are totally changing so i'm running out of time and before i i have to let you go i have this little game that i do i call it optimize it or disavow it for those of you who are first-time listeners, <laughs> thank you for listening. Um, it's where I'm going to give our our lovely guest two choices, either two really good choices, and she will have to choose one good choice over another good choice, or two really crappy choices, and she'll be stuck choosing one crappy choice over another crappy choice. So this is the Nick Ranger version of Optimize It or Disavow It. <laughs> So 
So it's zero sum. You could say it depends. We discover that answer on this segment of the podcast, but we will take it if you must. One or the other, zero sum. Would you create comparisons on your commerce site between your product and your competitors' products so that your your um, your potential consumer doesn't have to go to another site to get that comparison that they're going to get anyway? Or would you write how-to guides just about your product alone? So would I have a – sorry, I'm just trying to like qualify that in my yeah. mind. <laughs> so basically, um, you know I those have... pages – we're like, you know, yeah. they have all the comparisons, like all the different SEO tools. Of course, Rank Ranger is the best one. Yeah. Then you have the other tools also. And we would put it on their page because people are looking for, you know, review mm. of best SEO tools. So we'll get them on our site by doing that. Oh, they don't boy. have to write. It's very tricky, <laughs> very sneaky. We would, yeah. I, I would personally never do that in this vertical because yeah. our audience wouldn't appreciate that. But, hey, people buying scars might not realize that. So I'm, I, yeah. I'm not saying be a horrible person, <laughs> but hey, be advantageous. Or would you just create a how-to guide, like you know how to uh, how to choose the best scarf for your scarving yeah. purposes? I feel like oh, I really want a third option of like poking the lost us. <laughs> Why not both? <laughs> no, but that's the whole um, point. That's the whole point. Yeah, I know. Oh gosh. Well, look for the first option. Not a lot of um, not a lot of businesses are happy to have a a super critical look at their own products in um when comparing it to others um if you're going to have a comparison um that is going to draw in a lot of your competitors you've got to be um you've got to be really super real about the limitations of that product because at the end of the day you just want to be able to give the best qualified advice um to help users decide a product and if you're not it then maybe that's not for you. <laughs> but like how-to guides around your product is awesome because consider like you buying, um, I don't know, a, a, a lamp or like a pendant, a pendant light. I'll, I'll use that one again. How to install that? Like, will I need an electrician? Um, if I'm trying to do DIY stuff, and I don't recommend this at all, but if this was something that you were looking into doing, how to set up, um, how to set up a pendant light um, like by yourself in your home, um, might be useful for you. Might also like <laughs> open you up to lawsuits if it goes wrong. <laughs> but like, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't um, actually try to do that at example. home. Don't actually try to do that at home. <laughs> I've seen that. I've actually yeah. seen that go wrong pretty bad. Thank you, oh, Nick. Gosh. Thank you, Nick. I yeah. love, that's a great answer. And thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome. Awesome. And we are back to your regularly scheduled insert SEO podcast. I really killed the timing here. Like I went on way too long with that that that, that <laughs> knowledge panel stuff. Because mm. that's really cool. It's okay. And people, I, I, I get it. Like people are going to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. And especially that Twitter card thing. Because you got to see it. <laughs> I I will link, by the way, I'll, I'll throw the links into the tweets I put out about this. So you can actually like see it. With that, Sapir, could you please hit it with the news? <laughs> was what appeared to be a massive unconfirmed algorithm update early last week. All signs, signs point to most of the changes Google made being reversed. Yeah, so I this like of course this happens like when I'm on vacation. <laughs> of course. And like people are asking, hey, what do you see? What's going on? So I'm literally in the car, my wife's driving, and I'm like, I'm checking out Rank Ranger on my phone. Uh, like, hey, what's going on here? What's going on there? So yeah, it did look like a lot of the sites that I looked at, I'm like, okay, this is this is like you know, something big happened. I was like on Saturday. By the time Sunday rolled around, it looked like the sites were going back to where they were before for the most part. So another weird reversal. This happened a couple, you know, even a week before that was some sort of bug. I don't think this was a bug. I think this was Google testing something. So maybe big update happening soon. Who knows? But sometimes when you see Google tests like that, it means that they're testing something and then they're going to roll something out. Okay, moving on. Google's updated activity cards in a big way. Instead of just showing you where you left off, the new format will show you options for products, recipes, and job listings related to what you are searching for. Right. I mean, my honest opinion, this is all about products. And I, I, I we spoke about this on this podcast before where I told you this was coming. Okay, Google's got to find a way to get you to the shopping results without, you having, without having to rely on you going to the shopping tab. So it's going to integrate free shopping listings onto the main SERP in all new ways. And this is another way that they're doing it because they have to support those free listings. I don't think people appreciate how big of a deal this is and how, to what extent Google is going to shove products down your throat 
I don't mean that in a bad way. That's a little bit. <laughs> in order to make sure that that succeeds. So more okay. more to come. More to come, I think. More to come. More to okay. come. <laughs> Moving on. Chatter seems to point to no new news sites being allowed into Google News thus far in 2020. Yeah, so what makes this one juicy is that um, it's, a, it's an automatic algorithm now to get accepted. So I don't, is something broken? Is like, are all these news sites just not good? Something is weird. I don't understand it. And if, and, and, and if there is something that's not working right, we're, we're talking we're in August. I'm pretty sure Google will know about this. If they don't, why do they know about it? If they do, why haven't they said something about it? Okay. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't say to that. Okay. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> Lastly, Morty. Yep. Listening. Bing, Bing is opening up its shopping to free products. Monkey see, monkey Microsoft. do. Microsoft. <laughs> okay. Microsoft Merchant Center owners can now have their products automatically shown for free. So far, this only applies to certain markets, include, including the U.S., Canada, etc. Yeah, so, okay, I said monkey see, monkey do. Not yeah. fair on Bing, because it, it is. But and it, and it, and it's, it's fine. Why reinvent the wheel, right? Hey, Google's doing something. Hey, we should copy that. Okay, let's go ahead and copy that. By the way, it works both ways, because Google often takes something from Bing. A lot of the SERP features, the way Bing has right. utilized them, Google said, hey, let's sort of copy that a little bit. So that's what they all do. Not trying to make yeah. a jab, you know. I'm not trying to jab Bing there. Right. Yeah. Okay, you said lastly, That's right? It. Forgot. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm terrible at that. Yeah. <laughs> so bad at that. Okay. <sighs> now we're gonna do a fun SEO send-off question. Sapir, I, I'm pretty sure we already did this one. I also think we did it before. What is this is getting out of control. It really is. I don't know anymore. Really. <laughs> Our poor audience. <laughs> God bless him for okay. listening. If we don't remember, if we don't remember, there's no chance. We're doing it anyway because that's what we got. Yeah. Here is right. your fun SEO send-off question. <laughs> so, Sapir, what repeat question do we have this week? I'm telling you, we did this. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I also think we did it before, but I'm not sure. So let's just do it. <laughs> The question we're asking this week is, what's Google's favorite season? Wow, that's, we definitely did this because like, it's, it's like a basic question. Like You would totally do this. Who, you you want to go first? I don't remember. I know, yeah, I don't remember first. either. I'll just say, hey, I, I'll we're, we're say, up to like 84 um, episodes, right? This is, is episode 84. I should know that. That's a, that's a lot of fun SEO send-offs to remember. Right. We right. should probably keep a list and be more organized. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, I'm going to answer uh, win winter because that's the superior um, season. Yeah. Oh, I like you did superior. <laughs> superior. <laughs> right. Wow. Well, nice. Wow. Do you have a superiority complex, Superior? Uh, maybe I do. Maybe you do. I mean, hey. <laughs> what does it have to do with Google? And first off, why is winter su superior? I'm just, I'm not against that necessarily. Just winter curious. is the best season Period. Why? Like, there's no. Why? <laughs> flu? Because of the flu? <laughs> Not flu. Just like the ambience, you know? Because it gets dark really early and it's like it's cold. Yes. You can't go out there. Right. Yes, and it's raining, it's cold, and, and you know you're you in the house and you watch the rain from outside, from like the inside. Rain. You, someone who lives in the desert it means snow. <laughs> rain. <laughs> you are so depressing. <laughs> Why? Yeah, actually, I am. That's like I have a dark personality, so automatically I just get drawn to, you know, right. <laughs> dark themed, I don't know, stuff. So, I yeah. was going to say winter too because Google is cold, which is probably what I said the first oh. time I did this question. Or you could say summertime because a lot of pretty colors are out, or springtime maybe, and Google has a lot I of pretty summer. colors. Summer is the worst season. Whew. How, how do you feel about rainbows and butterflies up here? <laughs> oh, I hate butterflies. I hate them. I squash them every time I see them. <laughs> I don't squash them. I'm just, I'm scared of bugs. So. You're a strange okay. duck. Okay. Yeah, so that's my answer. We. This has been another great fun <laughs> SEO send-off question. That was fun. That's yeah, that was fun. I think the answer is more fun than the question. Anyway. 
Thank you so much for tuning in. Check out another new episode of the In Search SEO Podcast next, next Tuesday, where we welcome Aaron Weike of Local U. Um, so that's going to be awesome. Check that out. We're back again next Tuesday. Thank you so much for tuning in to the In Search SEO Podcast. It's been In Search because we're all in search of something. something. Toodles.